Hello, my name is Frances Melgarejo, and this is a presentation of my master's thesis research. The name of my thesis is Tribal Survival Through Cultural Revival, How a Nearly Decimated Amazonian Tribe Resurrected Its Cultural Heritage to Stay United. An Emmy for the Amazon. On September 25th last year, this article from the World Economic Forum came out. It reads in part, the documentary Agua Vena has just won an Emmy Award. Made in collaboration with the Yawanoa people, it uses virtual reality to explore the journey of the first female shaman of the community. This story was very interesting to me, and it brought up initial questions to be answered. Who are the Yawanoa? The Yawanoa translates to the people of the wild boar. As wild boar are pack animals, the Yawanoa motto is the collective. Their population is approximately 1,250 and they live by a mythology which is based on a spiritual tradition known as Pajilaza or ayahuasca shamanism. According to the Yawanoa, shamanism has always been a male's role as it is a kind of spiritual hunting. Initiates are subjected to very difficult challenges, including long periods of isolation and ingestion of psychedelic medicines, including ayahuasca. Ayahuasca transports the shaman to the realm of the spirits, where the shaman communicates with spirits in order to bring back healing and knowledge to the community. The spirit of the Anaconda, native to the region, is credited with bringing ayahuasca to the Awanawa, bestowing knowledge through ayahuasca, and transmitting the art of kene. Kene are motifs, or patterns of motifs, based on animals and spirit beings that are painted on the body using natural paints from the environment. Kene are part of the traditional work of women. Body paint engenders joy, beauty, and protection from evil spirits. Yawanawa value beauty, joy, and unity. Where do the Yawanawa live? Since time immemorial, Pano language family, since time immemorial, the Yawanawa have lived on the Gregorio River, a tributary of the Juruwa. The Gregorio River is located in the state of Acre in southwest Brazilian Amazon. The Pano language family is native to this region of where Bolivia, Peru, and Brazil share their borders. The area is one of the most biodiverse areas in the world and is rich in rubber and gold. It is home to numerous uncontacted tribes. In 1984, part of the Yawanawa ancestral homelands were demarcated and given the name Teja Indígena Rio Gregori. In 2008, the land doubled to 725 square miles. The life of the Yawanawa has not been without conflict. Around 1870, the rubber boom began, a period of insatiable greed and widespread violence propelled by Western colonial forces. The demands of the boom affected fairly evenly the entire Acre indigenous population. The period reveals a historical process of domination and exploitation suffered by the Yawanawa, and a time of distortions in gender relations as the occupation and the management of the rubber tapping industry was done by men. This leads me to my questions. What caused the Yawanawa cultural revival and what role did Hushahu play? To address my questions, I followed the following methods. I conducted a qualitative study of the Yawanawa cultural revival phenomena from 1910 to 2020. I took a historical approach and reconstructed the chronology of the phenomena to find the, the crucial moments the crucial interactions with the dominant culture that propelled the community forward. Due to COVID-19, I was not able to go to the field nor perform interviews. Therefore, my multi-method approach draws data, draws data from document, audiovisual, and media analysis. More than 80% of the data was in Portuguese, which I translated. I also draw from my personal experience with the Awanoa when I visited their homelands in summer 2019. My research rests on grounded theory, which is a method of letting the data speak for itself. My findings demonstrate that through five stages of cultural integration and decolonization efforts, the Awanawa tribal society experienced a cultural revival. They did so, furthermore, by synthesizing values from the dominant Western culture into their own, including indigenous rights and gender equality. The five stages of the Awanawa cultural revival phenomena are the following. One, identity preservation. Two, territorial sovereignty. Three, economic security. Four, international recognition. And five, women's empowerment. 
The first stage, identity preservation, was led by Antonio Luis Yawanawa. In 1910, Antonio Luis organized rubber relations with the current rubber boss of the region, Antonio Carioca. Establishing these relations was a form of securing stability in order to continue their cultural practices. Their mythological shaman ancestor once said, we should stay right here by this river. By remaining on their ancestral homelands, Antonio Luis preserved the Yawanawa identity. The second phase was led by Raimundo Luis. He became the next chief after his father, Antonio Luis, passed away. In the 1970s, a global indigenous movement began where indigenous peoples and allies organized to fight for indigenous sovereignty. As a result, Brazilian anthropologist Terry Aquino arrived in the area to help. Upon, entering the, upon encountering the Awanawa, Terry informed them of their rights and helped them all along the way until they were achieved. By 1984, the Awanawa successfully achieved territorial sovereignty over at least a portion of their ancestral homelands, marking the beginning of a period of decolonization efforts. The third stage of the revi revival was led by Biraci Awanawa, nephew of Jaimundo Luis, Luis, grandson of Antonio Luis. While the Awanawa had tried several economic ventures, security only came in 1992. That year, Bidesi attended the UN Conference on the Environment and Development, also known as Rio 92, where he met Horsch Ragelbacher, owner of Aveda, a high-end US cosmetics company. The two were a perfect match as Aveda was looking for natural products and the Yawanawa were looking for economic endeavors that would help maintain their culture and preserve the nature around them. The partnership began a revival of shamanic and artistic traditions. The fourth stage of the revival was led by Tashka Yawanawa, son of Jaimundo Luis. Through a scholarship from Aveda, Tashka studied English in San Francisco. While there, he participated in the indigenous movement and met his wife Laura and other important allies that eventually connected him with Hollywood star Joaquin Phoenix. As a result of Tashka's initiative, in 2007, the two co-starred in the second Yawanawa documentary, entitled For Real Yawanawa, Joaquin Phoenix, which premiered on National Geographic and aired on MTV as well as UN conferences. The Yawanawa now became internationally recognized. The fifth phase was led by Pushahu. She is the daughter of Jaimundo Luis. Having suffered abuse as a young mother, Husha Hu had a conviction to fight for a better future for her children. As she says, I did not come to earth just to have children and go back. I must complete my mission because I'm a mother and I must protect my children. I must pass on a message to them. When Tashka returned to the village, he came accompanied by his wife, Laura Soriano, a Mexican of Mixteca Zapoteca heritage who had grown up around shaman women and leaders, attended school at a U.S. college participated in the San Francisco indigenous movement. When Lara arrived with Tashka in the village, Hushahu shared her dream of becoming a shaman with her. Immediately, Lara offered her support and communicated her wishes to Tashka, who in turn negotiated the request with Raimundo Luis and the great shaman, Tata. Lara's presence helped bridge the gap between the feminine and the masculine worlds. Thus, in the 21st century, the Awanawa experienced the novelty of a woman becoming a shaman. Hushahu received visions through her initiation, such as that of the butterfly woman, who represents the power of women, pictured in the top left-hand corner. Hushahu then translated the image into a painted kene motif, and then translated the painted kene motif into beadwork. The kene motif of the butterfly became a new symbol specific to Yawanawa women. As beadworker artist Leda explains, it was she who was able to lift us up. Through Hushahu's efforts, a women's cooperative was formed to help connect women bead workers with outside markets. This led to an important business partnership with the Rio de Janeiro fashion company Farm, pictured in the lower left. In 2017, Hushahu hosted the first women's retreat, a first among Amazonian peoples, which brought together women from around the world, including local relatives of the Huni Queen community, and encouraged the practice of women's specific rituals. Recently, she has begun to create a Yawanawa art house, which will be a community space for all to learn traditional Yawanawa arts. 
Through Hushahu's story, we can see that kene motifs function as an expression of the changes experienced in the community. As a final thought, I'd like to offer the concept of soft power. In conclusion, I pull from the theory that was suggested by anthropologist Leah McChesney 2019 when she studied Hopi women potters. Like the potters, Hushahu's shamanic artwork demonstrates her soft power to, power to transform the world through her art due to its embedded cultural beliefs, values, aesthetics, economic significance, and ability to forge relationships. A shift to valuing soft power suggests that the Yawanawa are experiencing a cultural shift from a male dominance paradigm to one of gender equality. Last but not least, I'd like to thank the University of Florida Center for Latin American Studies and Dr. De La Torre for funding my summer fieldwork research.